Hi, my name is Captain Stephen Thomas. I'm an instructor of English here at the United States Military Academy. Each year, the Department of English and Philosophy hosts a Shakespeare monologue performance as a culminating competition for an introductory literature course, EN 102. In years past, finalists have been selected across 75 sections, competing on Project Day, vying for the coveted title of Academy Idol. However, as you can imagine, this year looks a bit different. Because students are working from home, an environment not entirely conducive for a head-to-head -head Shakespeare competition, we decided to approach Project Day a bit differently. Instead of a real-time performance, what you're about to see is a collection of monologues recorded in students' backyards, their basements, their bedrooms, their homes. Their homes have become their stage. Outperforming over 65 accomplished actors, these 12 monologues submitted from those same 75 sections represent students who are the best and brightest in the academy, reflecting an innate creativity indicative of their excellence within our courses. From these, an Academy Idol will be crowned. Without further ado, I present to you the 2020 Shakespeare Showcase. Please enjoy. My name is Cadet Calvin Wetzel, class of 2023, from Company F4. I'm performing Act 5, Scene 1, Lines 1 through 22 from the play Othello. I am playing the role of Iago and Rodrigo, who are planning on ambushing and murdering Cassio. At this point in the story, Iago has convinced Othello that Cassio has been cheating with Othello's wife, Desdemona. Likewise, Iago has convinced Rodrigo that he can win Desdemona's hand if they rid themselves of Cassio and Othello. As a result, Iago and Rodrigo set their sights on causing the downfall of Othello, the Moor, which they believe will begin with the murder of Cassio. In my video, I attempt to take a modern, present-day approach to the play Othello. Here, stand behind this bulk. Straight Willie come, where that good rapier bear, and put it home. Quick, quick, fear nothing. I'll be at thy elbow. It makes us or mars us. Think on that. Fix most firm thy resolution. Be near a hand, I may must carry unt. Here, at thy hand, be bold and take thy stand. I have no great devotion to the deed, and yet he hath given me satisfying reasons but a man gone. Forth my sword, he dies. I have rubbed this young quat almost to the sense, and he grows angry. Now whether he kill Cassio, or Cassio him, or each do kill the other, every way makes my gain. Live Rodrigo, he calls me to a restitution large of gold and jewels that I bob from him as gifts to Desdemona. It must not be. If Cassio do remain, he hath a daily beauty in his life that makes me ugly. And besides, the more man fold me to him. There stand I in much peril. No, he must die. But so. I heard him coming. Hi, my name is Cadet Sailor Butters, class of 2023. I'm from company F1, and I'm performing Act 3, Scene 2, lines 13 through 46 of the play Julius Caesar. I've got my very authentic costume on, 
And in this scene, Brutus is giving a speech at Caesar's funeral, um, basically telling why he murdered Caesar for the betterment of Rome. Stay tuned. Romans, countrymen, and lovers, hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for mine honor and have respect to mine honor that you may believe, censure me your wisdom and awake your senses that you may be the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I love Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slave? Then that Caesar were dead to live all free man. As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoiced at it. As he was valiant, I honored him. And as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that would be a bond man? If any speak, for him have I offended. Who here is so rude that would not be a Roman? If any speak, for him have I offended. Who he is here so vile that he will not love his country? If any speak, for him have I offended. Then none have I offended. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. The question of his death is enrolled in the capital. His glory not extenuated, wherein he was worthy, nor his offenses enforced, for which he suffered death. Here comes his body, mourned by Mark Anthony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the commonwealth, as which of you shall not, with this I depart, that as I slew my best lover, for the good of wrong, I have the same dagger for myself, and I shall please my country to need my death. My name is Mark Wabinski, class of 2023, company D3. I'm performing Act 5, Scene 6, lines 3058 through 3091 from the play Henry VI. I am playing the role of Richard III, Duke of Gloucester, who is a deformed hunchback with a stub of an arm was a villain trying to steal the throne from his family by killing his father, King Henry VI, and then plotting to kill his brother, George, and his family. <clears throat> what, will the aspiring blood of Lancaster sink in the ground? I thought it would have been mounted. See how my sword weeps for the poor king's death? Oh. May such purple tears be always shed from those that wish the downfall of our house. If any spark of life be yet remaining, down, down to hell, and I say I sent thee thither. <clears throat> I that have neither pity, love, nor fear. Indeed, tis true that Henry told me of for I have often heard my mother say, I came into this world with my legs forward. I had no reason, think ye, to make haste and seek the ruin that unsurped our right. The midwife wondered and the woman cried, Oh, Jesus, bless us. He is born with teeth. And so I was, which plainly signified that I should snarl and bite and play the dog. Then, since the heavens hath shaped my body so, let hell make crooked my mind to answer it. I have no brother. I am like no brother. And this word love, which graybeards call divine, be resident in men like one another. And not in me. I am myself alone. Clarence, beware. Thou keepest me from the light. But I will sort a pitchy day for thee, for I will buzz abroad such prophecies that Edward would be fearful of his life. 
And then, to purge his fear, I'll be thy death. King Henry and the prince, his son, are gone. Clarence, thy turn is next, and then the rest, counting myself, but bad till I be best. I throw thy body in another room, in triumph, Henry, in thy day of doom. Hello, my name is Cadet Hannah Lamb, class 2023, company A2. I will be performing Act 1, Scene 3, Lines 320 through 348. I'm playing the role of Iago when he lays out his motive and plan for taking down Othello early on in the play. Thus do I ever make fool my purse. For I, mine own, to gain knowledge should profane, if I would time expend with such a snipe, but for my sport and profit. I hate them all, and it is thought abroad that twixt my sheets he's done my office. I know not if it be true, but I, for mere suspicion in that kind, will do as if it is for surely. He holds me well. The better shall my purpose work on him. Cassio's a proper man. Let me see now, to get his place and to plume up my will in double knavery. How, how? Let's see. After some time to abuse Othello's ear that he is too familiar with his wife, he hath a person and a smooth disposed to be suspected, framed to make women false. The more is of a free and open nature that thinks men honest that but seem to be so, and will as tenderly be led by the nose as asses are. I have it. It is endangered. Helen Knight must bring this monstrous birth to light. My name is Cadet Chris Barrett, class of 2023, from Company E1, and I'm performing Act 3, Scene 1, lines 5 through 36, for the play Henry V. I am playing the role of Henry V, who is the King of England, and he and his army have just crossed over the English Channel, and they are in the middle of a siege, and during these lines, King Henry will be out motivating his men and getting them ready to win the battle. <laughs> But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen up the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature of hard favored rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let pry through the portage of the head. Like a brass cannon, let the brow overwhelm it, as fearfully as doth the gouged rock. Overhang and jotty his confounded face, swelled with the wild and wasteful the ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit. To his full height, on and on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from the fathers of war proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought, and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers now attest, that those whom you have called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood, and teach them how to war. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here. The metal of your pasture, let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit and upon this charge, cry God for Henry. 
England, and St. George. Onward to battle, man, onward to battle. For England. We will win this day. See the enemy quake in fear as we approach. Quakes of fear and run under the might of the English. My name is Cadet Aaron Hall, class of 2023, Company B2, and I will be performing Act 3, Scene 2, lines 73 to 107 from the play Julius Caesar. I am playing the role of Mark Anthony. At this point in the play, Caesar has been killed by Brutus and his men. The people, they support Brutus because Brutus has been able to put in them false accusations against Caesar. Mark Anthony was Caesar's friend and he is now getting ready to address the people at Caesar's funeral to change their minds about what they think of Brutus. Enjoy. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turred with their bones, so let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor hath cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lubrical, I thrice presented him a kingly crown which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once. Not without cause. What cause withhold you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. My name is Cadet Jonathan Gubert, class of 2023 from Company G4. I am performing Act 1, Scene 1, Lines 1 through 31 from the play Richard III. I am playing the role of Richard, where he states his introduction and self-hatred of his deformity. He also states why he has become a villain in the story. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. 
Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim visaged war had smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I, that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, Cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I hope by them. Why? I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time. Unless to spy my shadow in the sun and discant on my own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Then his monologue in King Lear, Act 1, Scene 2. And so, in this, Edmund is a bastard, which means he's an illegitimate child. And so, he's an illegitimate child of the Earl of Gloucester. And so, the way the law of this time worked was that only the firstborn son would inherit anything. And even if he were an illegitimate child, which he's not, illegitimate childs don't inherit anything at all. And so, the way the law works is the eldest child inherits everything, and the younger son inherits nothing. And so Edmund's Edmund's basically struggling with the fact that even though even though he, there's nothing wrong with him as a person, he's not going to get anything out of his father's inheritance, and he's going to be left with nothing basically. And so he's plotting to frame his brother for plotting to usurp their father, so that their father sees him and gives him the inheritance instead, because he believes that his father loves him more than he loves his legitimate brother Edgar. And that's pretty much the whole background. Bound nature, art my goddess, to thy law my services abound. Wherefore should I stand in the play of custom, and rent the curiosity of nations, and deprive me, when I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag a brother? Why, bastard, wherefore base? My dimensions are as well compact, my mind is generous, my shape as true as honest madame's issue. Why brand they us with base, with base, bastardry base, base? Who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale time? <laughs> Go to the creating a whole tribe of fox! God to me asleep and wake. Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund. As to the legitimate, fine wood. And then she's hid. Well then, my legitimate, if this letter speed in my invention bribe, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow. I prosper. Now gods, stand up for bastards. Hi, Cadet Connor Murphy, Company A2, Class of 2023. Gonna be performing lines 16 through 42, Act 5, Scene 5, uh, Richard III. Gonna be taking on the role of Richmond. In these lines, he talks about how he wants to combine the houses of York and Lancaster now that Richard's tear is over because he's dead. Uh, these are the final lines of the play, and they're pretty great, so here's what's to follow. Enter their bodies, become their births, proclaim a pardon to the soldiers fled. 
then submission will return to us. And then as we obtain the sacrament, we will unite the white rose and the red. Smile heaven upon this fair conjunction, that long have frowned upon their enmity. What traitor hears me not and says amen? England hath long been mad and scarred herself. The brother blindly shed the brother's blood. The father rashly slaughtered his own son. The son compelled the butcher to the sire. All is divided, York and Lancaster, divided in their dire division. Oh, now look, Richmond and Elizabeth, the true succeeders of each royal house, by God's fair ordinance, can join together. And let their heirs, God, if thy will be so. Enrich the time to come with smooth face peace, with smiling plenty and fair prosperous days. Abate the edge of traitors, gracious Lord, that would reduce these bloody days again. And make poor England weep in streams of blood. Let them not live to taste this land's increase, that will with treason wound this fair land's peace. Now so the wounds are stopped, peace lives again, that she may long live here, God say, Amen. My name is Cadet Allison Greet, class of 2023, Company A3. I will be performing Act 2, Scene 4, lines 259 through 280 of King Lear. I will be playing King Lear, um, who has just been portrayed by his daughters, Regan and Goneril, um, who have refused him all of his knights and basic hospitality even after he gave them his entire kingdom. Here is his heartbroken and angry response. Oh, reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Men's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous. Why, nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm. But for true need. You heavens, give me that patience, patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stir these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger. And let not women's weapons and water drop stain these man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags. I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall. I will do such things. What they are, yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws where I'll weep. Foolish of a lad. My name is Cadet Alexander DeSalvo, class of 2023. I'm company E3. I'm performing Act 2, Scene 1, lines 32 through 63. I'm going to play Macbeth. I'm going to be playing the role of Macbeth. And so in this part of the play, um, Macbeth is basically in his castle and Duncan is there the king and so Lady Macbeth has hatched a plan he's basically convinced Macbeth to kill Duncan the king so that he can fulfill the prophecy that the witches foretold of him that he would become king and so now he's kind of his brain is playing tricks on him and he's seeing this invisible dagger and that's kind of like what he's talking about is this a dagger which I see before me the handle toward my hand. Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I still see thee? Are thou not fatal vision sensible to feeling as to sight? Or are thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation? Proceeding from the heat oppressed brain, I see thee, yet in form as purple as to which now I draw. That was marshals me the way I was going. And such an instrument I was to use. My eyes. I made the fools of the other senses. Or else, with all the rest, I still thee seal. And on thy blade and dungeon, 
counts of blood. Which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs. Thus to my eyes. Now, or the one, half world. Nature seems dead, then wicked dreams abuse. The curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale hectate's offerings. And witched murder. I loomed. By sentimental, the wolf, whose house his watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost, a sure and firm set earth. Hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear, thy very stones. Pray to my whereabout, and take the present whore from the time, which now suits with it, while I threat he lives, weds to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan. For it is a now that summons thee to heaven or to hell.